Hi, I'm Nikhilesh. And I'm Kushal. We're the two broke scientists. So today we decided to do a different kind of video. Instead of talking about a new concept, we're going to talk about one which is something you've probably heard of, but a concept which is still widely misunderstood. That concept is computational fluid dynamics. Basically, the use of computers to simulate fluid flow. Because CFD has become so easy to use, a lot of people use it without really knowing the basics or even how to use it. So we thought that with this video, we could explain the basics behind CFD and what pitfalls you can avoid. And we're not experts on the topic, but we've made a lot of mistakes in the past. So hopefully you'll be able to learn from them and do better simulations yourself. Before we talk about CFD, we first have to talk about fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is the study of the behavior of fluids. As you know, a fluid can either be a liquid or a gas. Fluid mechanics is everywhere. Like literally, there is no escaping from it. From the moment you brush your teeth, your morning coffee, the windy commute to work, rain falling, rivers flowing, ships moving, and even rockets. You get the point. And because fluid dynamics is everywhere, scientists and engineers all around the world study this field with a lot of interest. People have been studying fluid dynamics for centuries. In the past, most of these studies were either analytical or experimental. Analytical is a bit tough to do and in, we'll explain why in a little bit. Experiments are fine and sometimes a lot of fun to do as well. But imagine trying to simulate the exhaust of a rocket engine in a wind tunnel. Or even tougher or something even impossible like fitting an Airbus A380 in a wind tunnel. This is where computers have become so useful. With computers becoming so fast and powerful, it's sometimes cheaper to just simulate a fluid flow instead of actually trying to do it in a wind tunnel. Okay, so we now know why we started using CFD. But let's dive a little deeper. It's going to get a little technical from here. So here's how we're going to break it down. First, we're going to talk about the differential equations that govern fluid flow. Next, we will tell you why it is almost impossible to solve these equations. Finally, we will tell you how to convert these equations into simpler forms so that they can be solved on the computer to obtain results. Like any branch of physics, fluid mechanics is governed by some fundamental principles. These are the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. The conservation of mass is something that you are already familiar with. Mass can neither be created nor destroyed. To help understand this, let's take an example of water flowing through a pipe. The conservation of mass says that whatever mass of fluid goes in has to come out. Mathematically, this can be expressed in an integral form in this equation. Now imagine, if you shrink the domain that you are interested in to an infinitesimal small control volume, mass conservation has to still hold. But now, the equation changes to a differential form. We won't go into the details of this derivation, but if you are interested in knowing how this is done, do let us know in the comments below and we will do a separate video to explain this. The conservation of momentum is an expression of Newton's second law of motion, which states that the rate of change of momentum is equal to a force. Now, even the momentum equation can be expressed in an integral form, like you see here, and as a differential form as well. Now actually, the differential form is more intuitive to understand through Newton's second law because you see that you have a mass represented by a density here times an acceleration, which is basically a force, which is now balanced by forces, the pressure force, the body forces, and the viscous forces that act on a fluid. So you see that the differential form of the momentum equation is an exact representation of Newton's second law and is very intuitive to understand. We have now talked about the conservation of mass and momentum. But there is still a third principle, which is the conservation of energy. The equation for the conservation of energy is very similar to that of mass, but it also has a separate variable of temperature. And we only solve it in cases where we expect the density and temperature of the fluid flow to change. Both the mass and the momentum equations together are called the Navier-Stokes equation that describe any type of fluid flow. Now, there are some characteristics of these equations that you would observe just by looking at them. First, they are both partial differential equations. 
Now, the momentum conservation equation, the term on the left hand side can be expanded and written as clearly you see that there are also some non-linearities in this equation. Another important characteristic of these equations is that both the mass and momentum equations are highly coupled, which means to solve any type of fluid flow, you need both the equations and you can't solve one without the other. Because the Navier-Stokes equations are partial differential equations that are non-linear and highly coupled, an analytical solution is almost impossible to find. And that's why you have to simplify the problem a lot. That is why an analytical solution for the full set of three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation is not possible and we resort to computational fluid dynamics. To solve a partial differential equation, you need something called as the boundary condition. The boundary could be the ends of the domain where you are solving the problem at or the surface of the region that you want to compute the flow in. But the Navier-Stokes equations are no set of ordinary equations. For a given three-dimensional problem with a set of initial conditions, mathematicians are yet to prove that a smooth solution exists. To overcome this problem, computational fluid dynamics is being used. Computational fluid dynamics consists of three main steps. First is the discretization of the problem, followed by a solution to these discretized equations. And finally, post-processing. Discretization is the process of breaking down a huge chunk or volume of fluid into smaller volumes or elements. This is one of the most important steps in CFD and if you had to ask me, I would say that it is the most important step. Because if your discretization or meshing is wrong, then you probably would not even get an answer. Or even if you do, that answer might be wrong. In computer language, this is known as garbage in, garbage out. To understand discretization a little better, let's take a simple analogy. Suppose you had to recreate this curve and initially you were just given two points on the curve. Well, you'd get a straight line which looks nothing like the curve. Now suppose you took three points. It's a bit better, but still not exactly the curve. Four points, five points, it keeps getting better and better. Now imagine if you increase the points to infinity, the number of points, you would be able to replicate the exact curve and that is the power of discretization. So if you don't discretize your problem sufficiently, then you can't expect to get good results. The next step is quite literally the essence of what makes CFD, CFD. Remember how we said that solving the complete set of Navier-Stokes equations is impossible? Well, how about we convert those set of partial differential equations into a system of linear algebraic equations? Let us consider we have a rod where one end is at zero Kelvin. If we want to find the distribution of temperature at different points along the rod, we need to know the differential equation which governs the physics. For simplicity, let us consider that the differential equation dt by dx is equal to one governs the temperature distribution along this rod, with t1 is equal to zero being the boundary condition. To solve this problem, which is a continuous one, we discretize the rod into four different elements. Now, if we solve this equation for each of the elements, we can say that dt by dx, which is nothing but the change in temperature divided by the change in length. So dt is nothing but t2 minus t1 and dx is the gap between the two ends of the domain, which is one meter. If we write these equations for the four different elements, we end up getting a set of linear algebraic equations. Isn't that amazing? We just converted a differential equation into its linear algebraic form. In CFD, we do something that is pretty similar to this. But these differential equations are converted to linear algebraic equations by using three main methods, which are the finite difference method, the finite volume method, and the finite element method. But keep in mind, all these methods are a way to approximate the differential equations. Once the domain has been discretized and the set of linear algebraic equations have been formed, the next step is solving. Now, the computer solves these sets of linear equations in steps, otherwise known as iterations. And if the meshing is done perfectly and the computer is able to solve them without any problems, you get a solution that is converged. Convergence means you have come as close as possible to the real solution of the differential equations. Now we come to the final stage of CFD, post-processing. Just because you have a solution does not mean that it is right. 
you always have to check the validity and the accuracy of the solution. And there are quite a few ways to do it. First, obviously, is a visual inspection. You check if the solution makes sense, physical or non-physical. Another common check is to ensure that mass is conserved. Because all the problems that we solve are approximations, we have to make sure that physically it makes sense. Whatever mass enters the domain is what has to leave. Another check you can do is to inspect the forces like lift or drag on the object that you simulate. You have to ensure that as the iterations progress, the values of lift or drag don't change. The Navier-Stokes equations are very robust. They can be used to solve any type of fluid flow problem like that from creeping flows, non-Newtonian flows and even turbulent flows. In the case of turbulent flows, a lot of scales exist from a very small scales to scales that are similar to the size of the domain. And the range of scales is dependent on a non-dimensional number called the Reynolds number. To solve all these scales, the domain has to be discretized to smaller scales. And this is computationally intensive. This type of solving is called direct numerical simulations, where the Navier-Stokes equations are solved completely. The expected computational time for DNS is of the order of the Reynolds number to the power of 3. Can you think of a reason why? The Reynolds number of many real-life applications, like let's say an aircraft, is of the order of the 10 power of 5. And this makes solving it using direct numerical simulations almost impossible. And this is where techniques like RANTS and LES have been implemented to overcome this problem with the Reynolds number. The Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, or RANTS, are equations which are time averaged and can be used to model any fluid flow. In this method, all instantaneous quantities like velocity are decomposed into its average and fluctuating component. Now let us consider the momentum equation that we already described. When you apply time averaging and decompose these instantaneous quantities into its average and fluctuating component, we obtain the Reynolds average momentum equation. If you look closely, in this equation, there is a term which is non-linear. This term is also known as the Reynolds stress term. To be able to obtain solution, this term has to be modeled. Modeling of this Reynolds stress term is very essential to obtain a closed form solution. And to come up with models for this Reynolds stress term, various techniques have been developed. Like, for example, the zero equation model, the k-omega model, the k-omega SST model, and the k-epsilon model. To obtain an in-depth understanding of RANS and its associated models, stay tuned to our channel. Large eddy simulation, or LES, is another technique like RANS which is used to model computational fluid flow. In this technique, the effect of the smaller scales are filtered out by applying a low-pass filter. Applying the low-pass filter to the Navier-Stokes equation gives rise to this equation, which is then solved to obtain results. This is done because solving these smaller scales is computationally very expensive. But the behavior of these smaller scales is kind of universal. That means it is independent of the external flow. As a result of which, these smaller scales are modeled and the larger scales, which are highly dependent on the external flow, are resolved. That was a brief description of what computational fluid dynamics is. As mentioned, it has processes like discretization, solving these equations and post-processing. In addition to which, there are different techniques in which computational fluid dynamics is performed, like direct numerical simulation, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, and large eddy simulation. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. We've also made another tutorial where we explain the basic steps in CFD using an actual solver. In this case, we used ANSYS Fluent, which is a commercial software. So if you're interested, you just check out that video. We have the link in the description below. And finally, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Bye! Bye.